Hillary appears before Chivarella. He just says to her, what makes you think you could do this? There's no, no one's presenting any evidence. <laughs> no one is calling any witnesses. And within 90 seconds, Hillary has essentially nodded her head. Yes, I did create this parody of my vice principal. And in an instant, she is handcuffed. And Lorreen, her mother, is both shocked and speechless and nearly hysterical at the sight of her daughter being let out of the courtroom. It's actually interesting because I was in the car with my friend Matt Cox, bringing him back from recording a podcast a few months ago, and he was telling me about his legal team in prison when he was down there who helped him out with, with his case and everything. And he mentioned very casually, like I'd known a couple of them, but he mentions the judge. I'm like, the judge? Who's the judge? He goes, oh, Judge Conahan. I'm like, that sounds awfully familiar. I'm like, hey, should I know him? He's like, yeah, the kid's for cash scandal. And I like almost stopped the car. I'm like, that guy was helping you in prison? He's like, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting people in there. I'm like, sure. So I went back and I started looking through all this because I remembered that case. And to me, it's one of the worst crimes I've ever seen. It's like not murder or rape or something. And I went in and, and saw how it originally was, was reported because I just knew the case and was familiar with what happened. And we'll talk about that today. But you were at the center of blowing the whistle on this thing. Um, I was at the center of blowing the whistle on how the judges treated kids in the courtroom. Um, Judge Conahan's partner in this uh, extraordinary scheme uh, was Mark Chivarella, who was the juvenile court judge up in mm -hmm. Luzerne County. And we discovered um, through representation of one young woman, 15 years old at the time, uh, that the denial of kids' constitutional rights were really uh, pervasive and rampant in his courtroom. The way most people know about Kids for Cash is about the cash, is about the money that changed hands between Conahan and Chivarella, a private real estate developer up there who built a for-profit juvenile detention center and a former co-owner of that facility. That was a parallel <laughs> scandal, yeah. it turns out, that was going on simultaneously with what was happening inside Chivarella's courtroom. And they were um, perhaps in one of those rare instances, a situation where two parallel lines actually meet. Yeah. And so when you're talking about constitutional rights being violated for these kids in court, are, are you referring to – well, what are you referring to? Um, Chivarella kind of ran an assembly line of injustice. <laughs> he essentially – had a really a, a kind of scam going where he encouraged kids to waive their right to counsel. Um, kids who are charged with delinquent acts, which is a criminal act, except we call it delinquency when they're under the age of 18. Uh, kids who are charged with delinquency in the U.S. have a right to counsel, just like adults yeah. have a right to counsel in criminal proceedings. And obviously, um, in most instances, counsel is really critical to not just protecting someone's rights, but making sure that the system works the way it's intended to function. Chivarella had a form that sat outside his courtroom when kids and their parents came to check in for their hearings, which was presented to them. And it was a very simple form that invited them to waive their right to counsel. Is that a legal form? It is not a legal form. It is not... <laughs> wrong. It is not illegal for someone to waive their right to counsel. It was legal at a point in time, actually not legal anymore, for a parent to waive their child's, child's right to counsel um, in a juvenile court proceeding that stopped being legal in 2005. Um, but Chivarella uh, did this in any way. Um, and he had a very high percentage of kids, over 50% of the kids who came before him, waive their right to counsel. And just to kind of help your listeners and viewers appreciate what that means, it meant that kids were going in front of a judge uh, who held their fate in his hands, who was not constrained by any notion of due process um, or procedural safeguards. And so kids could be found guilty. We call that adjudicated, delinquent in the juvenile justice system. Kids could be found guilty in a matter of a minute or two 
with the judge just looking at them and saying, did you do this? <laughs> and the intimidation factor that lots of folks feel when they're down in a courtroom right. looking up at a judge sitting above them, uh, kids tend to nod their heads. And that was the end of it. And it is it happened, as I said, in more than in more than fifty percent of the cases of kids who came before them. It was literally thousands of kids over a period of years. And the consequences were dire. Um, kids were sent away, removed from their homes, removed from their parents, and sent away uh, to juvenile correctional facilities. And they were sent away for some of the most minor shit, too. Yeah, I think one of the things that's really striking, there's many things striking about the Kids for Cash scandal. Um, you know, these were kids who did not commit rape, did not commit murder, did not commit assaults, did not commit robberies. These were kids who, for the most part, uh, were found guilty of harassment, of petty theft, of, you know, nudging someone, uh, just pissing somebody off, um, you know, giving the finger to a police officer. <laughs> Things that kids do. I think what, what's so remarkable when you look at the population of kids who got caught up in Kids for Cash is that so much of their conduct was just what we would expect of teenagers. Yes. Of course, that's what they did. Um, and they paid a very high price for it. And a lot of these kids were, it seemed to me, like the strike zone of kids who would be in front of them was like 13 to 16-ish, something like that? I think, yeah, 13 to 16-ish. I think that's probably about right. Okay. So this was up, I might have said this at the beginning, but this was in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, which is... Luzerne the, County is Wilkesboro, is the county seat of Luzerne, so northeastern Pennsylvania, next door to Scranton. Okay. Scranton's in another county, though? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Scranton is Lackawanna County. But it's up in that area. So... For people who aren't familiar with the scandal itself and how it worked, Chivarella and Conahan, they were both elected judges, right? Correct. So they had to literally, like anything else, run for office, have a campaign. This is what we're running on. And what years did they begin what we're going to explain, the whole like kickback thing? Like, how long so, did that go? Yeah, so Chivarella was first elected as a juvenile court judge, and he really ran to be a juvenile court judge back in 1996. He was re-elected okay. in 2006. The terms in Pennsylvania are 10 years. The kickback scheme, um, the alleged kickback scheme, um, really started uh, around 2003. What was going on in Luzerne County is that there was a juvenile detention center where could – Kids were sent to be held pretrial. Detention centers are like jails. They're pretrial facilities. Mm -hmm. They're not long-term facilities. Um, it was a pretty horrible place. Uh, I had been there when it was in existence. We sued the facility for some treatment of another child back in the early 2000s. Um, so the fact that Chivarell and Conahan had a desire to close it uh, was not the worst thing they ever did. Mm. It was a really vile horrible, rodent-infested facility um, that kids should never have been held in. Was there, like, abuse there, too, from the guards um, There and was stuff? Um, not the kind of abuse that I think we're sadly hearing a bit more about today, both for kids and adults in some facilities. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, as a country, we tolerate an enormous amount of mistreatment of, frankly, children and adults in our justice system. And I mentioned that we sued the facility in the early 2000s. It was on behalf of an 11-year-old boy who had been sent there, um, who was uh, really kind of tormented by other kids and staff. Uh, he wasn't beat up, but he was made to suffer. And we ultimately settled that lawsuit. But but Conahan and Chivarella had this idea of closing that facility and by closing it and shutting down admissions from Luzerne County into that facility, they really forced the county commissioners in Luzerne County to go along with their idea of building a new facility. As I said, that in and of itself was, was a good idea. It was a horrible facility that they were aiming to replace. What went wrong with that plan is that they actually gave the contract to – a developer to build a facility for um, two individuals, and Bob Powell, who was a 
de- criminal defendant in the Kids for Cash scandal who was one of the co-owners of the facility. They built private for-profit facilities. And I don't know whether or not people can appreciate the bizarre notion that I like to say someone wakes up in the morning and says, I think I'm going to like just start a business and make a living off of jailing kids. I think of jailing anybody and like that business in and of itself is crazy to me that I definitely want to talk about with you today. But I didn't even know before this case that private prisons for kids existed. Yes, they are not as common as they are in the adult space. They are not as common as they are in the immigration space, which was something that certainly I think really blossomed, unfortunately, under Trump. Um, But they happen in some jurisdictions. Uh, This was one of the first private for-profit facilities built in Pennsylvania. They're more frequent, probably not surprisingly, in the South. There are many private for-profit facilities in Florida and Mississippi. Um, But this was a first for Pennsylvania. And but that was the plan that it was a business that the individuals who created it were in it to make money by having the judge place kids there while awaiting trial. How does a business like I, I, this? This is one of those things I really want to go down the rabbit hole on. Obviously, I've always been. It's just a disgusting idea to me, like having a business of locking people up. But how does this business work? Like how does a how does one prison that's a for-profit prison get assigned inmates versus like a public prison and do they have a say in that matter do they have an agreement like a subsidy with the state that says they need a certain number number of people at all times and like how do they make money on it besides just like the state paying them uh so they make money by the state paying them or the county paying them yes um that's how it happens what what's going on in this situation and in any situation where you have private operators running these kinds of facilities is that they are fulfilling a role that we assume the government will fill. So again, when Conahan and Chivarella persuaded the county commissioners to go along with them shutting down what was a county-run facility, a not-for-profit facility, and build a new one, um, the they took over that function from the county running it to allowing a private provider to come in and run it. The county commissioners certainly could have said, no, that doesn't work for us. Uh, They didn't say that. They were persuaded by Conahan to go along with this idea. When the facility was first being contemplated, um, my my recollection is that there was some kind of placement agreement that the that Luzerne County entered into with the facility, um, and I think the developer to allow them to get loans, to, construction loans, to build the facility. So there was a kind of guarantee: we're going to fill this facility, and the state or the county are going to. They kind of split the costs, um, pay your per diem for every child who is placed there. And, you know, they make a profit by doing that. So the placement agreement that you referred to, that term is just like literally the number that we're going to have guaranteed it's at all a, times. It's an agreement, yes, to put kids in there. Um, over time, I think the relationship and the legal relationship between the county and the facility changed. Um, but the first exchange of money was in 2003 uh, when the developer for the facility, the person who built it, um, Miracle, essentially gave a million dollars to Judge Chivarella and he called it a finder's fee for putting him in a position to be able to build this facility. Chivarella took the million (laughs) dollars, thanked him (laughs) I think a lot. Oh my God. Um, never reported it, which is, you know, your financial fraud happens and tax fraud happens right there. Never reported it to state, federal taxing authorities. Never reported it to Pennsylvania Judicial Commission about his receipt of a million dollars for building a juvenile detention center. Isn't that a crime anyway, though? Yeah, like if he reported crime. it? Yes. Yeah. Oh um, and, it, and it's an extraordinary conflict of interest. I mean, again, I think yeah. – um, you know, as a lawyer, our our entry into the Kids for Cash scandal was really about what was what was going on with kids' legal rights. And one of the things that we all have in this country, um, 
when we go before a judge is that we have a right to assume that that judge is impartial <laughs> and is not conflicted in any way. And Shivarella was unquestionably conflicted by taking money yes. <laughs> from a facility that he was also therefore going to send kids to. That was never disclosed, of course, to any of the children who appeared before him. And so yet again, another example of how Shivarella um, over and over and over again violated kids' rights. So the facility itself then broke ground at some point in the early 2000s, but that actually – I assume if he got the fee then, that's when they were building it, so it opened probably a couple years later? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and the the Kids for Cash scheme in terms of the money coming into Chivarella's and Conahan's hands um, continued until 2008, which is when we filed our first petition with the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and I'm sure we'll kind of fill some of those details in. Um, but once that was disclosed – the whole system, the whole scheme kind of fell apart. But between 2003 and 2008, Shivarella and Conahan received somewhere around $2.8 million. So you mentioned that it was Shivarella that got the million dollars fi finder's fee. Does that mean that Conahan wasn't involved right away? No. He came he, in later? It, yeah, my understanding is that um, he essentially split that money. With Conahan, um, mm. and as I said, the total amount of money that certainly the FBI and U.S. Attorney identified as them having received was somewhere around two point six, two point eight million dollars. It came; some of that came from uh, Miracle, the developer. Some of it came from Bob Powell, who was the former co-owner of the facility. There were stories of thousands of dollars being stuffed in FedEx boxes that were delivered to the courthouse. Um, so between both the facility owner and Bob Miracle, um, there was this, you know, mil literally millions of dollars that were forwarded to Shivarella and Conahan. That's just it's so absurd to me that that was that that was something that they could even sleep with at night to be able to do that. But they, that means that they're getting they get the finder's fee, and then over those years. It sounds like pretty much per head, like per kid they send there, they get some sort of agreed upon payment. Yeah, um, it's it's more nuanced than that. It was never um, you got three kids there, you owe me three hundred dollars. But yes, by Shivarella continuing to send children to the facility, they made a per diem per day, a per diem for each of those kids. Um, which was high, higher actually than any other detention center per diem in the state. Why? Um, like why were because they, they Because that's what they charged. And although there was – there were red flags raised by um, an auditor in Luzerne County – for many years, they were able to charge that and Luzerne County and then at some point Pennsylvania um, paid a part of that per diem. Uh, that allowed them, of course, to be really profitable. That's mm -hmm. the point about for-profit facilities. And out of the monies that they brought in for each child who was placed there, there were monies continuously paid over to Chivarella and Conahan. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this episode, please be sure to share it around on social media and with your friends. Sharing the show and spreading the word is the best possible thing we can do to grow the show and continue to get great guests like this. So thank you to all of you who have done that and thank you to all of you who are going to do it now. And also, if you haven't already subscribed and liked the video, please do that. And if you're on Apple or Spotify, please leave a five-star review if you get a chance. That is a huge, huge help. And thank you to all of you who have already done so. Now... The original complaint that you were filing wasn't – obviously, you didn't know this was going on, but it was – you felt that constitutional rights were being clearly violated by – was it just Chivarella yes. at first? Yes. Okay. So maybe the best way to go about explaining what your – how you would come to be involved in this would be explaining how you founded the center back in 1983 and, and telling us all about the work you do there. 1975. 1975. I thought it was 1983. Wow, that's a long time. So you founded this center in 1975 then, and, and what is what is the full scope of what you do at the Juvenile Law Center? 
Um, so the full scope is that we advocate on behalf of kids in the justice and child welfare systems. Um, we started out um, decades ago as a kind of storefront representing individual kids in southeastern Pennsylvania in juvenile delinquency and abuse and neglect hearings. Um, the organization over time evolved into a national uh, public interest law firm for kids so that our work is no longer limited to Philadelphia or Pennsylvania. We do work all over the country. And for the most part, we're really focused on systemic reform. Mm. The way that we came into the Kids for Cash case was through – um, a phone call that we received from Lorraine Transu, who was the mother of Hillary Transu. Um, Hillary was a 15-year-old girl uh, in 2007 who was clever and snarky and adolescent and put up a fake MySpace page, um, which was a parody aimed at her vice principal in her high school. And she posted and invited friends in her school to post uh, snarky comments about her. It wasn't violent. It wasn't uh, threatening, uh, but it was it was adolescent. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, sounds very normal. It, it was extremely normal. <laughs> and some of it was actually pretty clever. <laughs> and she was ultimately the vice principal found, principal found out about the page. And one of the things that I think is just kind of important to note about how we respond, how we have come to respond to how kids can be adolescent and can be misbe and can misbehave and what, what I think is very central to how Chivarella got Luzerne County to give him their children um, is that she was never disciplined by her school for creating this parody of her vice principal on a social media page. Instead, they referred her to the police. <laughs> to the police for a parody page. Yes. And the police charged her with harassment, a misdemeanor. And that led to her showing up before Judge Shivarella. And what happened in her case was that she – was encouraged, her mother, Loreen, was encouraged by both a sheriff who initially reached out to them and let them know, your daughter has been charged with something, um, as well as the probation department. Their message to Hillary's mom was, this is not a big deal. You don't need to get a lawyer. She's probably just going to get a slap on the wrist, um, which is entirely accurate <laughs> in, the, in any other place. And... Instead, because this was Luzerne County and this was Chivarella's courtroom, first thing that happens is they show up outside his courtroom on her hearing date. Uh, they do sign the form to waive her rights because her mom has been told, not a big deal, nothing to worry about here. And Hillary appears before Chivarella. Everything is over in 90 seconds. He... Uh, just says to her, what makes you think you could do this? Um, there's no – no one's presenting any evidence. <laughs> no one is calling any witnesses. And within 90 seconds, Hillary has essentially nodded her head, yes, I did create this parody of my vice principal. Um, and in an instant, she is handcuffed and let out of the courtroom. And Loreen, her mother, is – both shocked and speechless and nearly hysterical at the sight of her daughter being let out of the courtroom in handcuffs. Um, what was uh, her sentence? Her sentence was 90 days in a different facility, not in um, the private for-profit facilities that Chivarella was also filling up, but in a different facility that Chivarella used. Um, yeah, 90 days for a 15-year-old kid who had done something that was um, predictable for an adolescent who had never been in trouble before. On her record forever, too. Uh, potentially, yes. So uh, her mother called us, um, got to us eventually. She called a few other agencies, and they eventually led her to us. And when we heard the story and heard the details of how the, the limited details of how quickly Hillary had um, been sent away, uh, we were deeply troubled. 
we knew Shivarella because we had been involved in a case um, of a young boy who had appeared before him about six years earlier under very similar circumstances, also unrepresented, um, a very speedy resolution, and he had also been placed by Shivarella. And so we both took on the representation of Hillary, um, got her out of the placement that she was sent to, um, but then decided to dig deeper and wanted to know how pervasive Shivarella's mistreatment of kids mm -hmm. was in his courtroom. Yeah, and she so she does ninety days in there, and and the the point I don't want to get lost in all this because it is a common thread among all these stories you see. These kids, people can Google this and watch the video of them being interviewed. Is that it is on a whole nother level when you are fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and sent to a prison, right? Like the the psychological damage of that is, I, I think, pretty immeasurable. Provided that you didn't do something like awful, like, yeah, you know, if a kid like kills somebody, obviously they got to go somewhere where they're locked up. That's different. But when someone's going in there for creating a parody account online, you know, you didn't really do that much wrong. And yet you're sitting here like, wait, why is society locking me up? And it's it's dramatizing. It's it's evil. It's it's like I, taking a case like that. I, I got to think that, you know, you're you're a lawyer. You're used to seeing the worst of the worst things you're used to getting in there and, and doing your job. But I got to think like as a mom, you're like, what if that was my kid? So, well, that's a great point. Since at, so at that time, um, I had a daughter who was 15 years old. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Um, so I had a daughter who was the same age as Hillary. And despite decades of doing the work that I do, it also felt very personal for me because I could instantly understand as a mother, what would this feel like to have my daughter taken away from me under these circumstances and placed in a juvenile correctional facility? Because we took on Hillary's case, she didn't spend the whole 90 days there. She spent, I think, about four weeks before we were able to get her home. How, how did you do that? Um, we f basically went back to Shivarella. We filed a petition in front of him um, asking for a rehearing because she hadn't been represented by counsel. Uh, he granted us that rehearing and we negotiated um, an arrangement for her where she was able to come home and her record was essentially erased after six months. Um, and but So Hillary was one of the lucky ones um, who benefited from that. But I, I want to – I don't want to lose your point about the harm that kids face and experience in these facilities. And even for children who commit murder, this the issue here isn't about – whether we hold kids accountable for what they do. Um, I think the issue has to be how do we hold them accountable? Mm. And the kinds of places in which we place kids, which many of them um, look like prisons. If they don't look like prisons, they feel like prisons to these kids. We are pulling kids out of their homes, out of their communities, out of their schools, all of the things that are essential <laughs> to yes. kids developing and to making that very critical transition into adulthood. And I think that it's unquestionably deeply traumatic and deeply troubling to think about kids who have essentially done nothing other than act like a kid um, being placed in what is essentially a correctional setting and having to confront the the isolation and the loneliness and the uh, um, frightening circumstances sometimes and being away from home. But that's traumatic for any kid, uh, you know, and that's another conversation we can have about how we ultimately think about what justice means, both for victims and for the kids who, um, who do hurt other people. But yes, I mean, certainly what was going on in Luzerne County, you had kids who were charged with the most trivial of offenses who were being ripped out of their homes and ripped out of their communities. When you took her case right there, were there instantly some other parents who may, maybe heard about that who then contacted you? There were not. And I think that um, that's a great question to ask and something to just take a moment to reflect on. Luzerne County, uh, you know, was a community that was struggling economically and financially. Um, and I think that the the people who live there, the families of kids who came before Chivarella, um, were made to feel powerless mm. and to feel that whatever 
public authorities told them whatever they did that they should trust that. And they did trust that. And while I don't think their pain and their fear for their children was any less than what Lorreen Transu was able to express to us directly when she called us, um, they, they did not feel that they could make that phone call. And I think it's important for us mm. to understand how, uh, how, how much of a role I think that played in Chivarella being able to get away with what he got away with. Yeah, and you had hinted at this earlier, but with the whole election that he had to go through, I guess, in 96 and 2006, my understanding, I've, I've seen video of it. I don't know. I can't remember if it was in 1996, 2006, or both. But this guy literally ran on locking kids up. Like, he wasn't hiding it. He would say, and I'm paraphrasing, but he'd be like, if you don't parent your kids, I will. And the connotation was that this is, you are electing me to get dangerous kids out of your community. Again, like if someone does something very wrong, okay, that has to happen. But why are you focusing on kids and, and not a, like if I were a voter hearing that, and hindsight's twenty twenty, but still, if I were a voter hearing that, I'd be like, what the fuck is this guy saying? This is nuts. So um, a little context, um, which will in no way justify or rationalize what happened there. Um, but the context in 1996, when he first ran, was that we were in the midst of the so-called super predator era. Oh, yeah. And mm. there was fear stoked in the country, and Luzerne was not immune from that, that we were on the verge of a generation of super predator teenagers who were going to terrorize our neighborhoods and our communities. That all proved to be false. The researcher who first alarmed, sent out the alarm bells, uh, literally retracted his research um, in 1997. But the, the lie stuck, as is so often the case, it tends to trump the truth. Um, the lie stuck. And so when Chivarella first ran, he was running um, – in, in a climate in which fear of crime and fear of kids was heightened. I think that it's really important, and I'm glad that you made this point, that the notion that Chivarella took that environment in which he was running and turned it into – we have to worry about the kids who are in our high schools, <laughs> just everyday kids in our high schools who might – be misbehaving in some way. And what I want you to do is to send those kids to me and I will take care of them was to take um, what, you know, any community has a right to want to be safe. We all want to be safe. We want to be safe in our homes. We want our kids to be safe in school, um, in our workplaces. He took that to a degree that was extraordinary because he literally focused on kids who were just mostly acting like kids and persuaded an entire community, persuaded the high schools and the middle schools in Luzerne County to make those referrals to him, to his probation department, and everybody went along with it. And when Conahan ran, because obviously he had to get elected as well, I wasn't familiar with that. Was he saying similar things? Or? Conahan never sat in juvenile court. Um, he was handling civil and criminal cases, so he wasn't uh, putting himself out there in making the same kind of pitch to the voters that Chivarella was very directly making. So how, how did Conahan get – maybe that's a good thing to go to then now. How did he get caught up in this? Like we talked about they probably split that finder's fee, but if he wasn't as focused on like – Handling the cases in court, how does he have value to this? He was, um, you know, he was an administrative and president judge uh, in Luzerne County, and his leadership position mm. in the Luzerne County Court. Uh, he was in a position, of course, to make things happen, and he was able to, as I said, convince the county commissioners to let them essentially abandon the old juvenile detention center and build a new one, friends with Chivarella, and was – this just became a literally a joint criminal enterprise for them. It's crazy how fast it all happened too to me because they – you know, this, this is very – I want to use the wrong term here, but this is very like kind of run-of-the-mill daily – court hearings you know you're talking about 90 seconds for some of these 
for again, what should be like, all right, you get a two hundred dollar fine or something, or or maybe like, all right, we we'll let you nothing. go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or nothing. Maybe it's like, all right, you get a warning because it's kids. But you know, it's like, what, what did you call it? An assembly line? It was an assembly. That's line. That's exactly what yes. it is. Yes, an That's assembly perfect, line of injustice. It's absolutely insane. So, you take that first case of the girl Hillary who was created MySpace account, and then. You were explaining that other kids' parents did not call you up because they they were afraid to and they had trust that this is just how the system works, unfortunately, in, in their case. So does that mean that you started personally digging on him and on each case and taking a look and then contacting parents of, of kids who you felt had been given – Severe injustice? Um, we did a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, we actually first reached out to the public defender in Luzerne County um, mm. because as, as an organization, Juvenile Law Center, um, because we're really looking at opportunities to – push for systemic reform. Um, we work with public defenders all the time who are in the courtrooms daily and have a sort of direct line of vision on what's happening um, in the justice system and how kids are being treated. And they will often be a source of information and insight for us. Um, and that allows us to think about um, are there particular issues that we should be taking on. So we call the public defender in Luzerne County, um, and unlike every other public defender office that we've ever had any communication with, uh, they were reluctant to assist us. And so, you know, this is the next part of um, how how does this happen, right? That's the question everybody want to knows. Everybody wants to know. It happens um, when even presumably good people look away. Right. And the public defender in Luzerne County was complicit in what went on in that courtroom because there was knowledge on their part. They were in the courtroom when scores of children appeared before Shivarella in any given week without lawyers. They observed <laughs> the assembly line of injustice that passed before them and they never raised their voice and they never raised their hand. Do you think they got paid? I do not think they got paid. I think that what happens all too often in our justice system is that there is um, a term that Amy Bach, an, an author, coined and wrote a book about it called um, Ordinary Injustice. And, and what that means is that people essentially succumb to the environment in which they find themselves every day. They become complacent. They are in front of the same judge every day. And they worry about if I – put up a fight here? Is that going to affect my next client down the line? This is their livelihood. They're not interested in rocking the boat. And all of those kinds of, in a way, you know, cliches that we hear about how it is that people allow bad things to happen in front of them was going on in Luzerne County. And the same is true for the district attorney. So I don't want to let the district attorney off the hook here. Um, in our system of justice, when someone pleads guilty, there is a very rigorous legal process that has to take place between the judge and the person pleading guilty to ensure that it is a knowing and voluntary plea of guilt. That's what we call it, knowing and voluntary. Quick question just for clarification so that I'm not off here. When you were explaining that the judge would talk to each of these kids quickly, it would be 90 seconds in and out. Is, there's always a prosecutor They're, at the other. Correct. Right? Yes. And they never said anything. Correct. That's exactly my point. The prosecutor is sitting there. <laughs> the prosecutor is sitting there, you know, adding another checkbox to their one that case file. Yep. Um, and they never said anything. They never raised a hand and said, you know, this actually isn't how this is supposed to be done. Um, so, so it's not surprising when you have – the, the very officials, the legal officers in the courtroom, district attorney and public defender, who are expected to and who frankly have professional obligations to, to honor the constitutional rights of the people who they yes. are dealing with, um, when they are looking away, the fact that parents trusted the system assumed that this is how it was supposed to operate. 
is hardly surprising. Sad that it is hardly surprising, but it, it does go back to the numerical top-down system that we live in. You know, like when I had Brian McMonagle in here, who's obviously a major league attorney you know, on the criminal defense side, has represented guys like Bill Cosby and Meek Mill and stuff like that. You know, we, we had a really great conversation about all the moral arguments within the at moral and ethical arguments within the legal system but one of the things that that we were both saying and, and agreed on heavily was that a lot of these cases where you have a prosecutor making a government wage usually more often than not they're younger people who are waiting to get the next job or whatever they are just a piece of what will eventually become a political ad that someone way above them runs to gain election where they say, and I was tough on crime and my records had ba 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 So when they're in there trying a case, th there, is a, there is a gamification thing where they, they're not personally in any way incentivized to say like, you know, we think this guy's innocent. Which then presents, I mean, you want to talk about an ethical and, and moral quandary. I mean, it shouldn't be a quandary, but y you you get into that system where the person coming in front of you is just the next job. Like if someone's a cashier at Wawa and they're checking people out every day, someone comes up, they pay for something, they leave. They come up, they pay for something, they leave. And you don't think anything of it. They're getting what they want. You, you're doing your job. You're getting paid. They probably have the same like psychosis in a courtroom but what you forget is that that's a human being right there who may very well like have their freedom taken from them today. And like oh. so on one case like I empathize with oh you can get caught in the run and mill of it. On on the other hand though, especially when you take it down to kids, like it, it, it should be the same way with adults too, don't get me wrong, but like when you take it down you have a 15-year-old standing next to you and you still don't have like a light click off like okay, maybe I don't need to get a checkbox here for somebody's fucking election. Like that just there's nothing about that, that that sits excusable with me. Well, and keep in mind that in so many of these cases, you probably had both kids and parents crying at the end of those 90 seconds. Oh, yeah. um, so the prosecutor, again, is there in that courtroom checking off a win and witnessing kids being torn from their parents. So, yes, they are complicit in what happened in Luzerne County. The public defenders were complicit in what happened in Luzerne County. So I would imagine, though, especially in speaking with the public defender, when you mentioned that had never really happened before where they don't help you, that's in your head got to be a time where you're like, okay, there's – we're going to war here. This is crazy. <laughs> um, it was um, – I mean it was honestly stunning um, that they took the position that we can't help you. Um, and so we did two – kind of two main things at that point. One is that we really wanted to know how many kids uh, were in this assembly line of injustice coming before Shivarella week in and week out, year after year. And we had the benefit actually in Pennsylvania of having pretty good data um, that is collected about how kids pass through our juvenile justice system. And so we were able to get good numbers um, from the Juvenile Court Judges Commission that did tell us that the rate at which kids were waiving their right to counsel, which allowed them to be processed so swiftly in front of Chivarella, um, was really off the charts in Luzerne County. The average rate at which you might have kids waiving counsel, you have 67 counties in Pennsylvania, um, the average rate was around 3 4% a year of kids in any other given county waiving their right to counsel. In Luzerne County, it was between 50 and 60%, not even close. When you got that first case, did you have access to that form? Did we she did, give you that? Uh, uh, very quickly, yes, we got it. Um, and the form, you know, again, this is kind of in the weeds of what the Constitution requires, but, but there are rules. And when someone waives their right to counsel, uh, there are things you have to tell someone that they're giving up when they waive such a profound constitutional right as their right to be represented in a criminal trial or a delinquency trial. The form was very uh, simple. The form was essentially, I understand I have a right to counsel. I hereby waive it. So it didn't check any of the boxes that you need to check in order to even consider that to be a legitimate waiver. Again, this went on day after day, year after year in Luzerne County. Um, so, so we were able to figure out 
that the numbers were crazy, um, that the numbers of kids affected were going to be staggering um, as compared to anywhere else in the state. And then the other thing that we did was we did um, try on our own to actually be present in Luzerne County, uh, try to see what was going on in the courtroom, um, hang outside in the halls, hang out in the parking lot, um, see if there were parents that we could talk to as they were coming out of the courtroom. Um, We ultimately, just to sort of give you a sense of the timeline, when we first cont- were contacted by Hillary's mother. Um, Lorraine called us, I think, in the spring of 2007. In that fall, um, we did have one person working for the public defender office uh, who kind of very surreptitiously finally agreed um, to help us and give us some information. And eventually we were able to get in touch with a couple of other parents whose kids had also been in front of Chivarella, um, had very similar experiences. And that allowed us to essentially um, put together in the spring of 2008 this extraordinary petition for relief that we filed with the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. A a petition for what? Uh, For extraordinary relief that we filed in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court that had nothing to do with money. Okay. We didn't know about the money then. Um, This was a petition to ask the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to step in and to allow us to um, get all of the names of the kids who had appeared before Chivarella in a specific number, a specific time frame, so that we could then petition to have all of their records expunged and their convictions reversed because they were not represented by counsel. So when you file this, though, because you didn't know about the money, did you have suspicion of that yet? We didn't have suspicion. Because that's a serious filing right there. Yes. Um, and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court um, ultimately denied that request. Um, but there's a series of things that kind of happened before we got to the denial, which is that we filed that in the spring of 2008. Um, very shortly after we filed it, we did get a call from someone working in the FBI field office up in Lucerne County mm. who had a lot of questions for us about our filing and wanted to know what we knew about Judge Chivarella and why we were filing the petition and what concerns we had about Chivarella. And that was both eye-opening and also confusing because (laughs) it was very clear when you get a call from the FBI asking you a lot of questions about a juvenile court judge against whom you've just filed a petition Um, that there's something else going on. It's also all in secret. Um, There was a grand jury that had been sitting actually for a couple of years at that point. A couple of years. That had been investigating um, what became uh, a very scandalous financial and tax fraud that Chivarell and Conahan were involved in. And so um, we could only – we could suspect and imagine and speculate that there was another story here. Um, but we did not appreciate the nature of that story until the federal indictments came down in January of 2009. Yeah, that's – I mean how often have you gotten a call from the FBI before? Uh, um, never. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, then- so it, was, um, it was clear something else was happening. Um, but it took a while for that information to be made public. Yeah, so they must have if – if that was sitting for a couple years, that means that obviously they were looking at some form of – fraud going on there so they they probably saw your case come through and i would assume it probably had some things in there that they didn't know uh and they were following the money and what they ultimately did when they filed the indictments in 2009 was that they really connected the money to the court romantics and they used the term in that initial indictment quid pro quo which means this for that uh, which was really their acknowledging that the flow of money was tied to a, a scam going on in the courtroom that allowed Chivarella to do with these kids what he wanted because there was no one to stop him. Right. And there was also during this time, I, I wasn't really sure what the full context was here, but there was another judge, Anna, I don't remember her last name, 
but uh, Lakuda. Anna Lakuda. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't Anna. What was her name? Lakuda. It was Ann Lakuda. Ann. Anna. Okay. Yeah. So Ann Lakuda was another judge on the Luzerne County Courts. Correct. Who had some sort of complaint brought against her, and was there was a ruling that said that she was removed from the bench. That she was appealing or something. That's right. And so she had some beef with not Chivarella, Conahan. with Conahan, who was the head of the courts, and apparently became a source for the FBI. So she Rumored she knew to be. Yes. yes she knew something hypothetically like as another judge on the court who wasn't involved with these cases or getting money for it. She even knew about the judges taking some money from a private prison uh, for these there kids? Were, there were lots of things that apparently the judges were involved in. There were allegations of um, – on the civil side, Conahan uh, kind of fixing cases in terms of uh, kind of making sure that awards in civil cases were what the plaintiffs wanted. Um, so when Shivarella and Conahan uh, were ultimately indicted – they were indicted along actually with several other people, um, but there was a fair amount of corruption going on in Luzerne yeah. County. Uh, it wasn't limited to the court. It spread out through um, actually the school administration um, in Luzerne County and certain other public officials. But uh, yes, Ann Lakuta also I think was a source in terms of other – information she had about what was going on on the Luzerne County bench. It's the ultimate fear for a lot of people thinking about, you know, the legal system here and how hypothetically when you compare it to the rest of the world, there's a lot of great unique things. And I would say it's, it, it is the best legal system in the world. Still has a lot of, a, a ton of flaws. And one of the things that's just beyond scary is when the people wearing the black robes up there who whether they're elected or unelected, who earn this right to be called your honor and sit there in judgment of fellow citizens when they are not biased, when they're literally criminals themselves up there making decisions on other people's fates, it, it's hard to not question the integrity of the whole system because people see a case like this and they go, oh my God, I wonder how many other places this is happening and we just have no idea. Yeah, um, it's always a fair question. <laughs> um, I think this was. I, I do think I don't think it's unique. I think it was unquestionably unusual. Um, I think it was a perfect storm. Uh, you had all of the following things happening that allowed something horrible to then unfold. First of all, juvenile court is a closed court. You and I cannot walk into that courtroom if we don't have a reason to mm. be there. Um, even as a lawyer, I'm not generally allowed to walk into another juvenile court hearing um, if I am not directly involved in that hearing. Members of the public can't go in. The media can't go in. Um, that means that there is very little transparency. There are no eyes on what's happening behind the closed doors of a juvenile court and that it is very difficult, therefore, to have accountability for what goes on behind those closed doors. So that's number one. Um, number two, you had – prosecutors and public defenders who were more concerned about job security than they were about the rights of the children who appeared in that courtroom. And number three, you had a community that was down at its heels yeah. and that uh, trusted people elected to serve their interests, to serve their interests. And when all of those things come together, um, it allows for something that happened in Lucerne County. You also had two individuals in Conahan and Chivarella who it turned out were, you know, I guess pretty easy marks to engage in the kind of criminal uh, conspiracy and criminal conduct that they engaged in. They were greedy. <laughs> turned out they were easy to be corrupted. Um, turned out they didn't care very much about kids. And all of those things uh, allowed what happened in Luzerne County to happen. That's not to say there aren't similar stories unfolding and we should always be vigilant about ensuring that our systems serve us in the way that they're supposed to serve us. Uh, but Luzerne County was, was a perfect storm of uh, – Lots of things going wrong all at once. See, the the top-down approach you guys had, though, to really blow this open is so important because it, it 
it could be replicated by a lot of people, and that is you went in and looked at the data. It's available. Yep. You know, you can see, all right, the state has 3 to 4% waving the attorney in child court and in kids court and and these guys got 50 60 percent something's wrong you know like you also mentioned the fbi line and my guy jim diorio from the fbi is in here all the time says it all the time as well and that is to follow the money you know there's no reason to not follow the numbers on things too that can get you the money right it's such a good point here because to me the fact that it went on for several years and you know, these guys had, they had a condo in Florida and it's, again, and a yacht, and a yacht. they're, they're public servants too. It's like, they're not making a ton of money as, as that kind of judge in, in that case. It's like, I don't know, man, there's, I'm, I'm glad that the FBI at least sounds like they were on it somewhat early to look into it. But why did it, why do you think it took so long to be able to get smoking gun stuff? Cause again, hindsight's twenty twenty, but there were. You know, just start with the condo. That this, that that whole thing was sketchy as hell. Um, you know, we could take a moment and think about the current situation we're in. Why does it take so long for the Justice Department perhaps to issue some indictments in some cases that some of us are watching? Um, it takes a long time to put all of the information together and to connect all the dots. What was going on here was that you know money was money was going in. <laughs> to Chivarella's and Conahan's pockets, but it was being given to them in surreptitious ways. It was being put in accounts that were not their own personal bank accounts. I think some of the money was put in accounts that were controlled by their wives at the time. Um, it was wired in very specific ways with very specific instructions. And then you had literally just cash being stuffed in boxes. And it takes a lot of investigation to ultimately put the pieces together that you need to put out an indictment that you think you have a certainly a better than even chance of yes. prevailing on. Um, and so, yes, sadly, um, it took years for the story to be pieced together. Uh, during those years, we had kids who suffered greatly at – as a consequence of their coming before Chivarella. Um, and, you know, that, that trauma that they experienced um, can't be undone. Some kids lost their lives as a consequence later when they became mm -hmm. adults um, because of lingering trauma that they experienced. And that can't ever be brought back. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we can, we, we can and we should look back and wonder why. Um, why it feels so hard to uncover uh, what what is these kinds of um, schemes that are unfolding in front of us, but the process demands a certain level of um, of some certainty, I guess. And there, to be frank and fair, I, there is a degree to which I I do understand that it's not. You can't always find that literal gun with the smoke coming out of it. I, I, I get that. So good thing they did find it and went through this. But when they brought this indictment, you know, these guys didn't just like fess up right away or anything. They did. <laughs> well, hold on. I'm sorry. They, they started to because they thought the punishments were going to be low and they were worried they weren't going to win the case in court. But then they stopped at least for a time. And I think Chivarella stayed out forever and went to trial. Where they they said you know what we did nothing wrong so indictment let's just start at the beginning indictment comes at, comes down January two thousand nine correct and how many counts was that thing it was a lot right uh, no the original indictment was it was actually technically called an information because the original announcement of the charges against Chivarell and Conahan included their agreement to plead guilty to a handful of charges that would give them both um, a seven-year prison sentence, okay? Uh, that's not a particularly long time. No. And that was the original deal. And the setup was that they would officially go to court for sentencing in August of 2009. Mm. So what happens between January and August of 2009 is that Shivarella talks too much and Conahan doesn't talk enough. 
Um, let me explain that. Okay. Shivarella uh, gave interviews to the media, including national media, in which he insisted that he had done nothing wrong, uh, that there was no quid pro quo, there was no kids for cash scheme. He was just doing what he thought was in the kids' best interests. And although he had technically pled guilty to something in order to get his seven-year sentence, he denied, denied, denied for the next eight or nine months. Conahan didn't speak at all. And the assumption was in exchange for the plea deal that there would also be cooperation between Chivarell and Conahan and federal probation. And this was an ongoing investigation by the FBI and the US attorney. And Conahan was completely uncooperative. And so by the time they both come before the federal criminal sentencing judge in August of 2009, uh, the plea is pulled because mm. Chivarella talked too much and Conahan didn't talk enough. And that put them in a position of two things happening. One, uh, with the pulling of the plea deal, the US attorney actually then issues like a 40 count indictment and charges them with way more uh, financial tax, wire fraud, mail fraud crimes than had been in the in the original document. What was the was the original? Were the you original saying the original is not an indictment? It's called an information because they already had a plea deal with Conahan and okay. Chivarella. Um, when that gets canceled out in August of two thousand nine, uh, they issue a new indictment that has many many more counts to it, and um, over the next many months. Conahan renegotiates a plea deal, and he ultimately is sentenced to 17 years in prison. Um, and Chivarella never renegotiates any plea deal and insists on going to trial. And Chivarella ultimately um, is found guilty of several counts, not all 40 counts, several yeah. counts of federal um, financial crimes. Uh, and he is sentenced to 28 years where he remains <laughs> yeah and belongs but that was another question there why did he he was found guilty on 12 of 39 charges mm -hmm. how how did they not find him i mean i assume there's going to be some charge here and there that like even the most guilty people like they don't get convicted of but that seems excessive like they didn't find him guilty on 27 of them um you know uh the Exposure that Chivarella faced on the 11 or 12 counts that he was found guilty on, um, frankly, could have put him in prison for life. So right. in a sense, did it matter that they didn't find him guilty of the other 20? Uh, you know, the thing about juries, and this was a jury trial, and this is a good thing, uh, you know, juries take their job seriously and they're charged with what they need to find beyond a reasonable doubt with respect to each count that Chivarella was charged with. And I think we should assume they did their homework and they f found 11 counts and they didn't find the rest of them. Um, but those counts on their own, of course, led to a prison sentence of 28 years. And that included like racketeering. It included absolutely racketeering charges, conspiracy charges, again, lots of financial crimes, um, it kind of, you know, examined through the lens of mail fraud, wire fraud, tax fraud. Mm. Okay. And what about the other two? So there was the builder, Miracle, and then one of the co-owners was that lawyer, Powell. Powell, yeah. They were both charged as well? They were both charged as well. Um, they both received uh, very, very light sentences. I think that Miracle only received um, a period of time of house arrest. Uh, I think that Powell served a couple of years. Um, they they were more cooperative. Powell actually wore a wire. Um Pre-trial, pre the trial of Chivarella, he did wear a wire, um, which certainly was used in Chivarella's trial, which kind of, you know, the the wire, I don't recall the exact, you know, conversation. Um, there's a transcript of it somewhere. 
Um, you know, but it's kind of revealing Chivarella, uh really kind of shaking Powell down for more money, you know, talking about <laughs> how he knows how many kids he's sending there. He knows how much money they're making, he expects to get more money. Um, so there was just more cooperation from them. And as we all know, um, just from reading the newspaper or watching Law and Order, um, you know, you get benefits for cooperating yes. um, with the feds. And they did that. And so they were treated uh, much less harshly than Chivarella and Conahan. But they obviously closed these private prisons, right? Uh, yeah, they essentially are not really functioning anymore. Yeah, because it's just it's like... Certainly not in Luzerne County. I, I understand the cooperation mechanism because the, the key to this case is, is the, the public officials who were corrupted because they hold, they hold the power to set law, basically, law and order right there. So I'm with that. But I don't know. I, when, when I look at symbolism of stuff, yes, I think it's great that he was found guilty of a lot of the very serious charges and everything and obviously was sent to prison for a long time as he should be talking about Chivarella right now but you know you'd like to think that again maybe there's a few charges in there that they might have just been going for but at the end of the day you'd love to see full justice it, I'm just thinking of from being one of those parents and, and seeing what the official record of the court says because you know there, there's one very famous case of all the many that was exposed to the public right after he was found guilty because you had Sandy Fonzo, Correct. the the mother of her Ed, son. Ed different, Kensikowski. Ed Kensikowski, whose son was going to college. He was slated to go on to college on scholarship for wrestling. And I think he was caught with like a weed bowl or something, mm -hmm. Like, which let's be honest, we all had that at that age. I'll speak for myself there. But like, you know, he gets caught and sent to prison for four months, has the scholarship pulled, doesn't go to college, ruins his life, and he commits suicide Correct. four years later. And when you watch this video of Chivarella on the steps, like giving some impromptu press conference after being found guilty, and you see this woman, I mean, it's righteously show, so lose her mind at mm -hmm. this guy. It's like you see the effect of that and and nothing's ever going to bring her kid back or get Correct. back the trauma the other kids suffered or the setbacks they had in life but like you know you, you want to see if if I'm a parent there I want to see a clean box score if you know yeah. what I mean yeah um yeah I mean I that's a, a heartbreaking story and there are some other heartbreaking stories of kids who um likewise uh took their own lives some accidentally um but I think that uh you know there's the, the justice system is imperfect uh, in many ways, and it, it can never fully redress or compensate, uh, I think, the harms and the grief often that, that victims experience. Um, I suppose, you know, in a way, it, it sort of tries to do the best that it can, um, but it's – whether we put people in prison or whether we pay people – large sums of money, um, it's difficult to put everything back in the box. <laughs> yeah. uh, we can't bring lives back. We can't erase trauma. We can't resolve grief. Uh, we, we have imperfect mechanisms for dealing not only with the harms that one individual might cause another harm, but with the individuals that our public officials um, cause the citizens whose lives and well-being are entrusted to their care. One of the things that you had mentioned a, a little bit ago, but I didn't want to get sidetracked because you were talking about something with, with the story with Chivarella, was how, and I think I'm getting your words right here, you had said justice is a very complicated thing, something like that, to that effect. In in talking about what, what you just mentioned there, though, it's like, the line to me, especially someone who's not a lawyer and doesn't have to think in some of the ways you do, the line to me as a citizen with justice is a really fine one that's almost bizarre in some ways because in order to mete out justice per se, you, you want to accomplish a couple things. You want to accomplish de deterrence and a form of like reimbursement for whoever was victimized by whatever it is, whether it be in civil or or in criminal court but i feel like sometimes in society we have a a stance of of two eyes for an eye 
if you know what I mean, where, you know, we don't think about these things in the context of what they actually are, which is like time and time in a place you don't want to be, especially when you're talking on, on the criminal side. So even when I hear something like seven years for those judges, which I agree was definitely not long enough, but even just that, it's like, that's seven years. That's a long time. You know what I mean? And someone's in a box for that time. So to me, I guess what I'm trying to get at is how as someone who has given your life to representing, in this case, kids, which I think is incredibly honorable, by the way, but in representing kids where, you know, they're they're caught up in a legal system where, yeah, sometimes they did do something very, very wrong. How do you balance justice for them to try to give them a chance at life with also recognizing that like there does have to be a level of like justice that is still meted out for those two main things I mentioned a little bit ago. Yeah, I think that um, in America it's hard because because I think the culture in America really supports our thinking about the justice system as a zero-sum game. Mm. I win, you lose. Yep. And losing is uh, not nuanced. <laughs> it's a total loss. And I think that particularly when certainly in my work thinking about the kinds of – conduct that kids can become involved in from the trivial to the most serious to homicide. Um, I, I don't think there's any question whether it's as citizens or as parents um, or as having been kids once, we, we all understand the the notion of being responsible for the actions that we take, being held mm -hmm. accountable, uh, understanding that there are consequences maybe for some of the dumb choices and bad choices that we make. But I think that the thing that has really, uh, I think, been front and center, certainly for our work in the last 20 years, is I think the scientific understanding that there really are legitimate developmental differences between kids and adults. Yes. Um, you know, we've all seen the commercials about kids' brains. It's true. Kids' brains develop more slowly than adult brains, and they continue to develop in very pivotal ways and critical areas of the brain into the mid-20s. But it's also true just as a matter of psychology. Developmentally, kids are immature until they become mature adults. And that immaturity is manifested often in the kinds of decisions and choices that they make and the way they make those choices, which is often subject to a lot of influence from peers. And it can be very negative influence. And all of that is to say that kids are not, in the words of the U.S. Supreme Court, they're not just miniature adults. Mm -mm. And when we think about even the most serious crimes that kids might become involved in and that they might commit, uh, we still have to treat them differently. We still have to treat them, uh, I believe, in accordance with their developmental differences between them and adults. And so that's where, for me, it's not about I win, you lose. Um, it's about recognizing that uh, the kids who are involved in our justice system can't be thrown away, can't be tossed aside. Uh, they, they have a right to grow up. Um, they have a right to demonstrate uh, that kind of maturity and sophistication that comes with age. They can come back into their communities. They can be productive members of those communities. Um, they're entitled to second chances, again, because they're, the choices they make are not made with the same level of intentionality mm -hmm. that you and I make choices. Um, so it is it is more complicated, um, particularly when we think about kids. And critically important that we also understand, and again, you know, this is true for adults as well, um, the, the brutality with which our justice system often imposes consequences on both children and adults. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's like, I always make the joke, but it's also dead serious. They call it Department of Corrections, and there's not a lot of correcting going on. Correct. It's it, you. You go into systems, and look, it, it's an environment thing more than anything. I, I had my friend Dan Thayer on here, who's an amazing guy. Who, you know, you wouldn't have thought he would have ended up amazing. Put it that way. He was put into the system when he was 15 years old in an adult prison. That was like going to college. He was there for seven years because a cop grabbed him from behind. He was a big kid and he turned around and then, you know, can't do that. Turned around, punched the cop, gave him seven years at 15 for that. 
So then he's, you know, he's committing crimes in and out of prison for the next 15, 20 years of his life. And he is the exception to the rule. He figured it out himself. He was not given any resources to do it. He just kind of had a coming to Jesus moment, so to speak, and then turned his life around as this unbelievable guy all these years later. But like, you can't count on that for people. And then when you're talking about putting kids into an environment like that, they become hardened by it. That's, that's, that becomes their identity. And they're also, there's no hope for the future. And you talk about like these, the cases that are even most serious pointing out the, the child homicide. I, I believe you wrote a, a paper to the Supreme Court about life without parole sentences for child right. homicide, right? Yes. Could, actually, before I keep going on, can you explain the, the background there and when that was and what that was all about? Well, yeah. I mean, um, you know, one of the good things that came out of the Supreme Court in the last 15 years um, was that we were able to successfully challenge really severe sentences for kids um, who were being charged as adults and being placed in prisons uh, with other adults. Uh, the Supreme Court in 2005 banned the juvenile death penalty. In 2010 and 2012, the court issued a couple of decisions in which it um, both banned life without parole sentences for kids convicted of non-homicide crimes and also banned mandatory life without parole for kids convicted of homicide. Um, and the, the rationale for those rulings was we have something called the Eighth Amendment in our Constitution, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. And and the court um, recognized in the case of children, because we do allow the death penalty for adults still in this country, and we do allow life without parole sentences for adults still in this country. But the court recognized that when we're talking about children, um, that we just can't hold them accountable in the same ways that we hold adults, even for the most serious crimes. And so we have succeeded um, at the extreme end of the spectrum. <laughs> in eliminating those kinds of extreme sentences. It doesn't mean kids aren't still facing decades in prison because of the nature of our justice system, which again can be ruthless in seeking retribution. Is what you're talking about at the federal level, state, or both? It's both. Yeah, it's both. So a case I was going to bring up in this commentary now is even more relevant. Are, are you familiar with the Ethan Crumley case, the kid who was the school shooter like a year ago? 15-year-old? This is in Pennsylvania, right? I think it's Michigan. Oh. This is like... a kid who just... This is like last November. Right. He and was 15 years old. He killed... It was awful. I mean, he killed right. a few students. And the case was just resolved somehow, right? Yes. He pleaded guilty. And I ask this because he is facing life without parole. Now, obviously, we, the school shooter thing is a whole nother conversation, but... Without going into that detail of it right away, you know, this kid's crazy. You know, he, he killed several other kids. It's like the worst type of crime. It's, it's a homicide. It's a multi-homicide, multiple homicide. But I had, when the case first happened last year and they were, they announced a couple things. They announced that they were, they were seeking to try him as an adult, which I believe they didn't end up doing. And the second thing was that they were going to be looking for life without parole. The, let's start with the trying as an adult. That's actually a good place to start. I have a real issue with not having a black and white line in the sand, as imperfect as that is sometimes. To me, an adult, as it's legally defined as of right now, I guess like psychologically agreed upon for the base level cases of things, is 18 years old. So my line is that if this is going to be a legal system that doesn't have slippery slopes, if someone commits a crime at 17 years and 364 days, you technically need to try them as as a juvenile and, and not an adult. Right. Why do people still get tried as an adult? Like why – how can a state decide like, oh, we're going to try this person as an adult and a court says yes? Um, the reason they can do it is because there is no – so-called right. There's no constitutional right to be tried as a child in the United States. It's no, mm. not guaranteed by the Constitution implicitly or explicitly. Juvenile justice systems, for the most part, are creatures of state law. There is a federal juvenile justice system, but it's tiny compared to the tens of thousands of children who are involved in state-level juvenile justice systems. Um, and every state has a mechanism for trying kids as adults. I agree with your central premise, though. I mean, certainly my own view, the view of Juvenile Law Center, is that 
uh, we should not be trying kids as adults if they're under the age of 18 um, for whatever crimes they commit. The issue with respect to life without parole sentences is is that in cases of homicide, um, the Supreme Court rulings did prohibit a mandatory sentence but does Mm. not prevent a sentencer from exercising their discretion following some steps, uh, some process to make sure that the sentence is appropriate to that individual, but there there are going to continue to be life without parole sentences, uh, even for kids convicted of homicide, tried in the adult system as a matter of a judge's discretion or potentially a jury's discretion. Um, that's kind of where we are left with the Supreme Court cases. So it hopefully will be few, rare, uncommon, um, but the sentence has not been absolutely categorically prohibited. Yeah, see, a, a lot of the school shooters we've seen, the profiles are usually pretty similar, 18, 19 years old, right? And a lot of them kill themselves before they the cops get their hands on them and the ones that don't we see what's happening with nicholas cruz right now it is very hard for me to have empathy there i there's you know as a human being you want to look at things and say okay how why did this happen and how can we take steps to prevent this again by learning about that person and maybe what went wrong in their life but you know it's like one of the worst things ever this case with ethan crumley was a little different for me because he was so much younger he was 15 his, his environment failed him. His parents failed him. His parents, like, encouraged him with the gun. The school system had signs of it and didn't do anything about it other than I think they called his parents in once. And it was like – I forget exactly what the evidence was, but this was, like, crazy stuff he was doing. It was very, very clear where his head was. And so everything around him failed. And, like, yes, this is a person who has severe mental problems and needs to go away for a while and, and hopefully be corrected. But that's my point. I'm like, I don't get how you could have like life without parole on the table for someone at that age with that environment because there's no way that that, that someone like that had any form of a decision-making mind to have any true concept, in my opinion, of what they were doing. Well, that's right. And, you know, we're also pretty much the only country in the world that would sentence a 15 year old yeah. to life without parole. Um, we stand out for our willingness to impose that kind of a sentence on a child for all the reasons that you said. I mean, obviously, um, if you look at his individual circumstances, his age and his home and what was going on in his life at that time, the many ways in which family, community, school failed him. Um, we, we, yes, some of us imagine uh, a different way of meeting out justice in that case. But unfortunately, um, you know, we currently operate with a justice system that is much too quick to really elevate retribution above every other concern such as rehabilitation or deterrence. Um, it's really, it is very much an eye for an eye um, that drives our justice system. It is this I win you lose. And until we are able to, I think really as a society, have a cultural shift about how we think about what justice means, um, we're going to continue to see these kinds of sentences. How would you, I, I mean, this is like the billion dollar question right here, but what are some steps that you see on the table right now that could be accomplished over the next five, 10 years to move things in the right direction? Like if you had your choice and didn't have to go through all the bullshit of government and laws and all that, how would you adjust the legal system? Well, you know, it's interesting. In the, the last 10 years or so, we actually saw some extraordinary, um, I think, e- positive steps that feel like they're threatened right now in this somewhat hyped up narrative about crime that we're hearing. Um, So in the juvenile justice system, uh, the numbers of kids who are incarcerated um, as kids in juvenile facilities has dropped by 50 or 60 percent in the last 10 years. Um, Arrest rates by and large, yes, there have been some legitimate spikes in crime and some serious concern about spikes in violent crime by kids. Even so, arrest rates remain historically extremely low. Uh, In Pennsylvania, just to talk about Pennsylvania, uh, there were 10 years ago, 
26 juvenile detention centers that serve 67 counties. There are now 14 juvenile detention centers. Hmm. And the population numbers, the rate at which kids were being put in juvenile detention has dropped by 80%. Those are good numbers. That shows that the system was moving in the right direction, was using custody less, keeping kids in their communities, diverting kids out of the justice system. All of that right now feels fragile (laughs) because we are, I think, coming out of COVID. A couple of things are going on. Um, One is I I don't think there's any question but that the disruption at every level of society caused by COVID uh, is is a piece of the increases in crime that we're seeing from family disruption, school disruption, community disruption for kids. It's also true that COVID had a really interesting effect on employment patterns. And what is also happening across the country is that a lot of the correctional facilities, both juvenile and adult, but we'll talk about juvenile facilities, are really understaffed. And that creates um, a very combustible situation where you have more kids being put into placement because of a fear of crime and uh, renewed reluctance to send kids home, reduce staffing in these facilities so that they cannot manage overpopulation and overcrowding in the facilities. And this is a story that we're now starting to see in states across the country, in local jurisdictions across the country. And these things feed on themselves. Yeah. So they start to, again, make a case for, oh, maybe we need to lock more kids up. So when you ask a question, you know, sort of what's my vision or what do I think can happen? Uh, part of me is looking backwards and saying, well, actually, we kind of did it. Um, we succeeded in drastically reducing the numbers of kids that we were putting into custody that we were incarcerating and without an increase in crime. The increase in crime is all in the last couple of years. And as I said, I think it's very COVID related and criminologists are going to write books and articles about this. Of course. This. Um, and I haven't heard them talk about on a specific, in a specific sense. I haven't heard them like talk about kids with the crime about it. It's that's hasn't been a narrative that right. I've seen. Um, so, so I'm, I worry that the, the wisdom that we were able to put out there and to act on, um, in terms of better ways to deal with kids who come into the justice system will fall by the wayside as we get, you know, kind of sucked back into this tough on crime narrative. Uh, we know how to do it differently. We know how to do it better. We know how to keep kids home and communities safe. And my hope is that we can hold on to those experiences and yeah. that reality and continue to march down that path. I also think the country owes a great debt to the kids in particular with COVID yes. almost more than anyone else because, you know, I, I thought about it at every level, all the way up to college, but down from the smallest pre-K and, and kindergarten and, and the earliest developmental years, these kids lost most of like a year and a half or two yeah exactly yes, they did. and and you, now we're seeing it and the test scores coming out and the people who are surprised by that i'm like are you dumb like what what did you think was going to happen here you have kindergarten teachers teaching on zoom like right. there's nothing they can do you know and so i don't think especially when we're talking about some of the societal downturns with crime and stuff like that in certain places that has happened as a result of mass unemployment, you know, loss of hope, all that stuff. I don't think, like I said, I haven't seen it dragged on the kids and and I would strongly hope that that does not happen. I, I do think there are, you know, there's some legitimate concerns with adult society with that for sure. Um, I, I don't think the answer is broken windows policing, so to right. speak, or right. something like that. But yeah, I mean, when you see... For example, what was happening in San Francisco where they won't even like respond to a call if a robbery is less than 750 bucks. It's like, all right, well, this is this is getting out of control. It's like when you when you don't do the common sense stuff well, that's where then people who may be motivated to crack down on crime then have a political case to come in and, you know, swing the pendulum all the way back. And I, I do try to at least in the conversations we have, keep the pendulum here on things in society. It's just so so goddamn hard. 
Well, you know, common sense um, is a great word. Think about common sense gun regulation. Um, you know, it's impossible to not have a conversation about crime and rising violent crime without also talking about guns. And we do know, again, from data that even in the increases in homicides, the increase is really about gun homicides. And, you know, the unwillingness for so far a, at least controlling group, whether it's a majority or not, it's actually not a majority, but a controlling group of individuals to resist common sense gun regulation and gun controls that would keep guns out of the hands of kids. That seems like a relatively smart thing to do. Um, you know, I think we're the prevalence of guns in this country also makes us different from other countries in the rest of the world that don't see the kind of crime um, that we have here and the kind of violent crime that we have here. So that's um, a, a whole other conversation, but it is a piece of the culture in which we live um, that we have to be responsive to. I, I, I agree that that is a, a central question that, you know, we, we need to at least talk about because it feels like that that's not what happens. It feels like there's just complete opposite interests here. And so it's just a yelling match on social media and nothing ever happens. And I do think, especially when you look at like mass shootings in schools and stuff like that, the data doesn't lie on those things in that we do have a, a tragedy problem that other places see a lot less of. This is one of those issues that Oh, probably a year ago, I would have thought I was like really conservative on, but I've been corrected on that narrative because I'm I'm not apparently because I do look at some common sense things that I I think should at least be bipartisan brought to to the table to discuss. Where I definitely have the what I would call more conservative leanings is that I do worry about the slippery slope <clears throat> of where things end. So, for example, I don't worry all about. At, about background checks. I know for a fact that in there's plenty of states in this country where, yeah, a 12-year-old walks up to a gun fair and walks away with a gun. That's insane to me. Absolutely insane. But I also know that looking at it across like law-abiding society and whatever, you know, criminals do get their hands on guns. And they will do that regardless of what it is. If there's less access to some things, it'll get more expensive. I think there's an argument to make there. But when, when we're talking about the regulations of continually banning specific weapons, as much as I agree, like, yeah, I don't see a need for me to own an AK-47, I understand the deterrence factor that was written into the Constitution about that. And I really, I really understood that looking at countries that did not have rights to guns during COVID and what the governments did to people there that made what some of the restrictions here look absolutely like nothing. So to me, it's a very, very difficult problem to solve, but a very common sense solution to start with that is being prevented by, you know, the narrative of either take all guns or NRA, like put them all on the street and carry them to the, to the festival you go to. That is preventing the conversation of, all right, well, how do we make sure that even the, like the federal level, we increase the ability of law-abiding citizens to have to prove that they are able to get a gun. I, th it just seems like a very obvious place to start for me, and I don't hear that conversation happening. Yeah, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I guess I, I guess so, but you know, on on the to to stay with with the topic of justice and and meeting it out and and things like that. I mean, did you ever see the? The video of the man whose son was murdered in a it, it was like a he was a delivery driver and he's speaking at the sentencing of the nineteen year old kid who did it who's facing life without parole and he argued against it yes yeah yeah very very powerful video mm -hmm. and one thing I don't fault is when when victims families are upset and are calling for the worst thing we they are emotionally biased and i get that completely and part of the system is that you're supposed to be objective outside of those people to be able to meet out the correct justice and not just what they want but not that i would ever expect people to have the grace or understanding that that guy did i think that's quite unique it that really got to me because the judge was still able, and the judge was emotionally moved as well, but the judge was still able to hand out significant justice. Like that kid got, he got like a 
25 to 30 year sentence and he's going to serve over 20 years for sure. So yeah, 19, 20 year old kid right now, he's getting the whole middle of his life taken from him and has that on his record and is a murderer and all that. But the father looked at it like, I can't bring my son back. Why not? This, this kid never had a shot. You know, my son had a, had a nice home. He had two parents, you know, we loved him and everything. This kid his his father wasn't around. His mother didn't give a shit about him. He was taken in by kids on the street who came from similar situations. And, like, he didn't premeditate to do this. It was a horrible thing that happened. Why completely end his life in this case? To me, that is the kind of thing, like, forget it being the father. That's the kind of thing that when you're the defense and the prosecutor and you're trying to line up in front of a judge who's also part of the process here to mete out justice, it's, like, severe because it's long. But also hope and and potentially like giving someone a reason to exist too to want to improve themselves because like that father hugged that guy and as a human being like the the defendant as a human being you look at that that was legit you know that kid had never been seen before and the first person to see him is the guy whose kid he killed you know that's it that's I would recommend everyone go watch that video on YouTube because it's a powerful thing and I know it's a it's an ideal situation, I guess you could say, but something about that struck a chord of the balance of, of justice and, and hope that I feel like we should have more of in the system. Well, we shouldn't assume that all victims speak with only one voice, and this is an example of a victim um, who is stepping away from mm. the traditional path that we associate with victims, which is, again, retribution, retribution, no sentence is too long. Um, I do think that there is, um, again, kind of culturally, we have fostered and tolerated uh, what I call a kind of toxic dance between prosecutors and victims, which is prosecutors delivering a message to victims that uh, the the only uh, kind of redress you can get here. The only thing that will make you feel better uh, is if we put this person away for as long as possible. Uh, there's not a, a conversation going on at the same time that is looking at what do you, what do you need here? Um, putting someone away in prison doesn't doesn't bring your loved one back. Right. Uh, it doesn't necessarily end your grief. Um, is there is there another way to think again about what what does justice mean? What do we want justice to mean? And I think for the father, um, you know, in the case that you talked about it, it was. It was brave and courageous. It was um, an act of extraordinary compassion and empathy yeah. uh, in the face of the most extraordinary grief that someone can experience. And we need to, you know, to honor that in the sense that he is he is more open-minded in trying to understand not only what he has experienced, but what the person who caused his loss has experienced. And that's very rare. Yeah, it's incredibly rare, but it's like I said, it's certainly very powerful. And you know, it 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 leads to a, a, another. I mean, that's that's an extreme case in the sense that that was a murder. So of course, we know how those things have to go. People have to go to prison for a very long time. But you know, you mentioned it a little bit ago the the overall incarceration rate in this country. So I'm glad to hear we have some nice trends on the kids side. I wasn't aware of that, and I I share your hope that that continues to be the case. But, you know, I, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what the numbers are in the United States. I know it's in the millions right. as far as people who are – Around 2 million. Uh, right. Okay. So it's in that area. There's three, roughly 335, 340 million people in this country. So our rate, the average number of citizens or of people per hundred in our society is significantly higher than anywhere else in the Correct. world for incarceration. What do you think led to this? Like, how did we get here? Because we're supposed to lead the world in freedom and justice and things like that, you know? Yeah, we don't. Um, yeah, so the numbers, you know, that we hear quoted all the time are that the U.S. represents about 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the incarcerated population in the world. Um, I think there are a number of things that lead to it. Certainly one of them, frankly, has to be rooted in slavery um, and runaway slave uh, acts that were passed um, after the Civil War that created uh, – it, it, 
support for uh, locking people up and yeah. especially locking black people up. Um, and that combined with, um, I think, a, also a kind of mindset that, again, is very eye for an eye, very retributive in how we think about the purposes of our justice system. It leads to two things. It leads to uh, the highest incarceration rate in the world and the highest racial disparities in the world. Uh, we are a justice system for both kids and adults that is largely black and brown. And, you know, we had arguments in the U.S. Supreme Court this week talking about affirmative action that will probably lead to ending affirmative action, uh, which is, you know, a reflection of a changing view that uh, all of a sudden uh, we want to deny uh, the racism that is at the heart of hundreds of years of American history. And if if we allow people to deny that, we will perpetuate the kinds of disparities that um, drive our system right now. Yeah, it does feel like between what we've seen publicly, whether it be like the shit Kanye West has been saying, which is about, it's about Jewish people in that case, and then seeing how certain people respond to that, not necessarily in the way of like, obviously that's all wrong, they they don't say that, but it it just seems to me like society is post pandemic really teetering on this on an on a new level of tribalism that's unlike what we saw in the 2010s, and it is coming back to race and things like that. And I think it actually also prevents having these conversations properly because there are now people who are so pissed off, regardless of what their background is, about their reality that. Even bringing up the idea that like something's not equitable for other people shuts them down. And I, I don't want to be a part of the conversations where it's like, you know, we just say, okay, no problem, go about your life. I, I think these are things that, that have to be talked about because like you said, when you're talking about like minority populations in prison especially, it, it's, it's a generational thing. Because people can look at it and say, okay, well, how could it go back to something that was 150 years ago or, or something like that? Well, when you take a father out of a household for something minor and then that just kind of keeps going down the line or then you take a mother out of the household, you're creating you're, – you're removing any chance for a normal environment and you're perpetuating situations that are going to encourage poverty because the other problem that we haven't discussed today is that you know, to me – when you pay a price that was meted out by court for justice, once your debt is paid, it's paid, right? So what I see too much of is people go to prison and then they can never get a job again right, right. or something like that. Or they can't vote. Right? It, sure. And plenty of other rights as well. It's like not just those things, but where do you where do you draw the line on that? Because I will say – you know, when it comes to like the sexual predators list or something like that, I do think there's an argument there. Even if I have to hypocritically say there might be something anti-constitutional about that, but I'm going to be honest, like, yeah, I want to know if a rapist is living next door. You know what I mean? So like where do you draw the line with where people have to have something show up on the record that prevents them from even getting hired anywhere versus like, no, that kind of has to be on your record and society's going to do with that what they will. Well, the problem with sex offender registries is that we put kids on them as well. And there is great research uh, that has not been refuted that kids who commit sex offenses um, when they are teenagers, uh, their recidivism rates are in the neighborhood of 2 or 3%, maybe maximum 5% in terms of ever committing another sex offense. A lot of um, sexual behavior that kids engage in when they are teenagers is, again, kind of normative for adolescents. And so to the extent that we take that same view, I want to know if there's a rapist in my neighborhood, um, and impose that liability and disability on a child who 15 years later is living in your neighborhood and did something when they were 14. Mm. Um, what is the point of that? Uh, that's something that Juvenile Law Center has actually done a lot of work on. We've actually, we succeeded in getting rid of juvenile sex offender registration in Pennsylvania um, by winning a case in our Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Um, we have also fought for legislative reforms in other jurisdictions. Uh, what was what, that case you won? 
Um, it was uh, well. It, it's in, in initials. It's JB because we don't use names of kids. Right. Um, but uh, you know, whatever your position may be, and I'm not going to speak to that because I don't represent adults. Whatever your position may be with regard to sex offender registries, they make no sense for kids. They don't keep communities safe. They harm kids enormously by creating precisely the kinds of challenges that you identified. They can't get jobs. They can't live in certain places. They can't. Uh, be around other children. Um, and it can lead to really dire consequences for them and profound depression, obviously. And uh, for, for what purpose? It's not keeping communities safer because these individuals are not threats. Yeah, I wasn't even talking. I didn't even know kids could be on that. Yes. So I wasn't even talking about them. I'm yeah. talking about in general in society because I, I don't you know, you'll always find an exception where someone's like, oh, well, he definitely should be. But again, that's not how the law works. You have to have overall what's the good versus bad and where does it weigh most of the good. So I, I agree with your, your point there that they shouldn't be on there. But like at high level society, including adults, that list is one thing. For everything else, though, it's like to me, OK, a guy guy robs a store or something, does has a gun on him, does five, six years in prison or something like that, hopefully is corrected. That's another problem, separate conversation, because that's not really happening. But, like, you know, that dude struggles to ever get a job again. Right. And yet he served his time, paid his debt. Right. I, I don't know how to fix that because, like, it's on society to be like, you know what? Yeah, we'll hire him. But at the same time, you know, there's legal liability that businesses are thinking about. There's all these different things. And we know that these people have these records because it's it's on there and it's not expunged or anything once they're done. Right. Right. Yeah. Um I mean it's it's again a part of our unwillingness to let them back in. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else that you're specifically working on right now that, you know, you're looking forward to making a change on or some sort of I don't know, legal paper you're writing for the Supreme Court, maybe? Um, you know, we've done a lot of work um, actually in the area of fines and fees for kids. Um, the, the idea of charging people administrative fees, charging them fines, seeking financial restitution, which I think is incredibly common in our justice system. Uh, there are many challenges going on in the adult criminal justice space to those kinds of economic charges for kids, again, as I said, with respect to um, kids involved in sex offender registries, it makes no sense. Kids have no financial means. They are dependent upon their parents if their parents have financial means. And so we, we are, um, you know, kind of carrying over from the adult system a system of financial penalties that kids cannot fulfill. And yet their failure to pay fines or probation costs or administrative fees or even restitution can actually be used to put them in a custody situation to actually incarcerate mm -hmm. them for being unable to do that. Um, so we ha are aggressively um, challenging fines and fees. It's more through legislative reform than it is through court reform. Um, we have some a few cases where we're, we're raising these issues as well, but we've had some success um, across the country in actually getting rid of fines and fees in juvenile court. It's, it's just a, it's another, um, you know, kind of holdover of how we think about what we're supposed to be doing to hold people accountable that when you drill down and think about, wait, does this make any sense for kids? It makes no sense for kids. Yeah. And like you said, a lot of it will come back on the parents and stuff. I, I think it's really sad even with adult cases where, you know, government comes with a case that's not the greatest and in a, in a lot of situations the person is innocent and then they have to spend – their family has to spend their life savings just to get a decent lawyer to defend them. I mean that's just like – it's far too common and, and it's a problem with the courts because then you also – to be fair, you know, there's some attorneys out there and I'm thinking more on the civil side with those kinds of things who – you know, they they make it about like, well, let's charge as much as we can, you know? And so then people 
who you know aren't an attorney themselves and have a case that they believe in they don't understand all the minutia happened being thrown at them and suddenly they you know they don't have any money to to pay for what they need in court i mean there's so many different angles you can run into it from both sides of it between the people who are making the laws to the people who are upholding the laws to the people who are in court fighting the laws as lawyers whatever it is it's like you're never going to have a full answer that everyone has every problem solved. But I do, when we have these conversations with someone like you who's devoted their life to, to fighting for justice on, on things that you view as wrong, I think it's good to be able to point out, you know, the, the little things here and there where you can make, you know, that next layer of progress and hopefully make it as perfect <laughs> as you can. Right? Yep. Well, thank you for, for all the work you do. I, I think it's thank a great you. thing. And, and where, where can people find out more information about the Juvenile Law Center and, and how they can help? Or uh, if they can help. JLC.org. Okay. And do you guys do like donations or? Uh, we are entirely supported through uh, donations, um, whether it's private philanthropy, foundations, private individuals um, is essentially how we survive. So by all means, take a look. Awesome. All right. I will send people there. And, and thank you so much for discussing the case today and, and everything else. This, this This was great. Thank you for having me. All right. Everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace.